Turn with me, please, to the book of Judges. The book of Judges. The book of Judges, chapter 20. The book of Judges is, among other things, a book of wars. A book of wars. It always tabulates the casualty statistics. Now, we see a pattern in the book of Judges and God's dealing with Israel that very much applies in principle to what's happening today. When God's people, Israel, turned away from the faith of their fathers, turned away from the Torah, his word, God would bring other nations in judgment against them to get them to repent. They began imitating the pagan nations, worshiping their gods, accommodating them, and God would bring the Philistine the Amorite or whoever, as an instrument of correction to his people. I have been saying for quite a number of years that radical Islam, and what we call radical Islam to Muslims is just Islam, is God's judgment on the Judeo-Christian world. I lost a relative in September 11th, my sister's husband. I don't say this easily. I was in Jerusalem and a bomb went off where I was five minutes earlier and killed 17 people on a bus. If I had been there, God knows. I've seen terror at its worst. It has affected my family. Uh, my son was in the IDF. I was for a short time, but my son was in a combat brigade, uh, the Israeli military. Uh, my, my family's been affected by terror. It's not easy to admit this. Perhaps if my family was not affected by terror, I should not be the one to say it. But radical Islam, as we would call it, is God's judgment of correction on the Judeo-Christian world. My grandfather was from Manchester. I used to live in Manchester. This is God's correction. People don't tell you this. That Ariana Grande, whatever her name was, she is an activist on behalf of homosexual and lesbian causes. And she imputes this thinking to young teenagers, to young teenage girls as normative. Manchester, England arrests Christian evangelists on the streets, but does nothing when radical Islam is promoted on the streets for fear of appearing to be Islamophobic. This is God's judgment. Theresa May, at the prompting of Barack Obama, voted for UNESCO to make the condemnations it did at the behest of Obama. She did it. Without being a prophet, just looking at Genesis 12, 1 to 3 and Obadiah verse 15, I said, God's judgment is going to come on Britain from Islam as a result of what that terrible, crooked, phony politician did. Had Hillary Clinton been elected in America, I have no doubt there would have been a terrorist attack from Islam in America. Uh, this is God's judgment. It's God's judgment. Where a federal judge will legislate from the bench, telling the president he can't protect the borders and he has to let people in from countries who you can't vet, even after 56 homosexuals were killed in Orlando, or a bomb was blown up at a Christmas party in San Bernardino. No, we can't vet these people. We can't let anyone in until we can vet them. No, that's discrimination. You have to let them in. It's madness, but it's God's judgment. Yes, these courts are crooked. Yes, these politicians are hypocrites. Yes, that's all true. But it is God's judgment. That is what we see recurring in the book of Judges. You want to be like them? You want to accommodate their gods? Okay. A leader of that pink hat movement, Linda Souser, says you can't be pro-Israel and be a feminist. Yes, she defends Saudi Arabia, but women have no rights. I've been to Saudi Arabia. I have been, I'd like to take Gloria Steinem or, or Rosie O'Donnell to Saudi Arabia and see what happens to them. I, I'd, love, I'd love to take them over there. And Madonna, I'd love to take them to Saudi Arabia. Unbelievable hypocrisy. That's how hypocritical Israel became. 
and they reaped what they sowed. America and the West, Britain, Australia, Canada, it is the same. Understand, not God is causing these things, but he is allowing these things as he did in Judges. It's the same pattern. Now let's look when this happened, when the woman was gang raped and her corpse dismembered. Every war in the book of Judges, when God would raise up a judge, a shofat, these were not juridical magistrates, these were military leaders who God would raise up at a particular time as liberators, once the people repented. Every war, it gives the statistics. How many fell, how many were killed. The ugliest war, the most brutal war, the most costly war in the book of Judges is the last one because all the others were the Hebrews fighting the Canaanite, the Hebrews fighting the Philistine, the Hebrews fighting the Amorite. But the last one was Jew fighting Jew, Israelite fighting Israelite. The worst battles, the worst wars we will ever have is the ones we want least. I do not care about picking up the sword, this sword, against Islam. Bring them on. Roman Catholicism, bring them on. New Age, bring them on. Freemasonry, bring them on. Mormonism, bring them on. Jehovah's Witnesses, bring them on. I'll pick up the sword at the blink of an eye. But I hate, I detest, I loathe. My soul grieves when I have no choice but to pick up this sword against my brother or my sister. I don't want to do it. But like Jehu, there was no other way. Like Phineas, there was no other way. In this war we read in chapter 20, verse 28, And Phineas, the son of Eleazar, Aaron's son, stood before it to minister in those days, saying, Shall I again go out to battle against the sons of my brother Benjamin, my brother? Or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. My brother, not the Philistine, my brother. My brother. Look, I'm a brash New Yorker, flavored with Israeli culture. I'm by nature like a sarpa plant, prickly. <laughs> Your mother wears army shoes, you know that? That's how I grew up. Yeah. I could give elocution lessons to, to Tony Soprano. <laughs> That's where I came from. Yeah, you hear me mouth off about the money preachers who have discredited Christianity, and the ecumenists who are selling us down the river to Babylon. But I don't enjoy it. I don't want to do it. I'd rather shut up. People say to me, let God refute the error, you just preach the truth. I wish it was that simple. But if it was that simple, Paul wouldn't have written 1 Corinthians. He wouldn't have written Galatians. He wouldn't have written 2 Thessalonians. The Hebrew prophets like Amos and Hosea never would have picked up the quill to write. It sounds nice, philosophically appealing, but it's man's wisdom, not God's. It's my brother, Lord. Shall I go to war against him? Go up! Can I fight the Philistines instead? Can I take on the Jehovah's Witnesses? Can I take on Islam? That's my brother. They're believers. At least at some point in their life they profess to be born again. I don't want this. Go up! Who wants that? Nobody in their right mind wants that. This was the worst war. 
And it was Phineas who heard from the Lord and gave the counsel to do it. And it was not the first time. He's memorialized for all eternity in the Word of God. In Psalm 106, let's look at it. They join themselves also in verse 28 to Baal Peor. Now the Hebrew can under, be understood as Baal Peor or Baal At Peor. And eight sacrifices offered to the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with their deeds, and the plague broke out among them. Then Phineas, in Hebrew, Pintas, stood up and interposed, so the plague was stayed. And it was reckoned to him for righteousness to all generations. Notice, until he stood up and interposed, the plague was rampant, was devouring everything. The plague had to be stopped, and he did it. They ate sacrifices to the dead. My family is a mixture of Roman Catholic and Jewish. Let me tell you the problem of a crucifix, other than the fact that it's a graven image that you shouldn't bow down to anyway. Because it's hishtag vaya, proscuto in Greek. It's an act of idolatry in the original text. Here's the problem with the crucifix. The wrong person is on it. Christ is risen. The one who should be on it is us. Mm -hmm. Pick up your cross and follow me. Crucify the old nature. You got a crucifix with yourself on it. If I had a crucifix on a wall with me on it, that would make theological sense. That would doctrinally make sense. But he is risen. To offer up bread and wine to a corpse on a cross that's eating sacrifices to the dead. We are told in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, we are told no fewer than five times in the epistle to the Hebrews, he dies once and for all. It is a perfect sacrifice. If you understand the doctrine of the Mass, he dies again and again and again sacramentally. Roman Catholicism is a fundamental denial of the sufficiency of the cross. He does not have to die again. If something is perfected, it's perfect. If his blood cleanses from all sin, you do not have to atone in purgatory for your own. If we're saved by faith through, faith through grace, by being born again, you're not saved by an ex opere operato ritual called the sacrament, administered by a pedophile priest. Which gospel do you believe? He, not me, he, said if anybody says I've returned physically, other than the way I left, I'm coming back the way I left. Don't believe it. He's in the wilderness. Don't go there. He's in the inner rooms. Don't go there. Right now, within 20 minutes drive of here, there's a Catholic church saying that Jesus has returned physically under the appearances of bread and wine. They pray to it and they worship it. The priest lifts up the host before the cross, the crucifix, and in Latin mutters, hoc est corpus meum. That's where... Luther got the term hocus pocus. It's true. This is my body. No, 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 no. We are his body. <laughs> the eating what is sacrificed to the dead. He is not dead. He's alive. How many ex-Catholics here? Put your hand up. Do any of you doctrinally disagree with what I've said? Do any of you disagree with what I've said? No. It's always some evangelical Protestant or flaky evangelical ecumenist who will disagree. It's never somebody saved out of it who disagrees. It's never somebody who knows what it is. It's never somebody who's got a relative in it, who's got a grandmother on her deathbed with rosary beads dying in fear hoping not to go to purgatory when the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. But the Roman church is only one aspect. 
Now we've got Chrislam. Chrislam! Trying to combine Christianity with Islam. You've got youth of the mission. You can call Jesus by the name of Pele, the Hawaiian volcano god that they used to throw their infant babies into to placate him to stop the lava flows in Hawaii. You shall have no other gods before me. Baal at Peor. Let's begin with the Baal. My apologies, as always, to those who know this. Baal, the Hebrew word for husband, master, and owner. Yahweh was Israel's Baal. Baal. In the Columbus Telephone Directory, you have two different people named David Robertson. Does that mean they're the same person? Well, neither does the fact that their name is Jesus mean they're the same Jesus. This, as David Hawking says, 40,000 Jesuses in Mexico City. Jesus. <laughs> We're the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints, and I got a burning in my bosom, and I testify to you, the Church of Latter-day Saints is true. Now you've got evangelicals like Ravi Zacharias, a man I once respected, playing footsies with them, not drawing a distinction between their Jesus and ours. According to the Book of Mormon, their Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan, or the Jehovah's Witness Jesus, who's Michael the Archangel, or the Islamic Jesus, who's inferior to Muhammad, or the Catholic Jesus, who's bred and wine transubstantiated. That's not our Jesus. The Eucharistic Christ of Rome is not our Jesus. The Jesus of Islam is not our Jesus. It's not our Jesus. Jesus of Mormonism is not our Jesus. They have the same name, but you got a Jesus, we got a Jesus. We got the same Jesus. No, we don't. That's what was happening with Balat Pior. They confused the Baals. The devil is always in the details. That's why God told Moses, be careful to do all I tell you. The Canaanites had pagan holidays, worshiping false gods in the agricultural cycle, the same day as the Hebrew holy days. The Hebrew holy days were in part a polemic against the Canaanite Idolatry. Notice what it says. They provoked God with these things. They were rebellious against him. But the plague was stayed by Phineas, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness for all generations. The guy who stands up, his righteousness will live after him may not be too popular in his lifetime, but his righteousness will live after him. His righteousness will outlive him in the biological sense, not in the spiritual resurrection sense or anything like that. Well, let's read this story. Let's see what happened. Turn with me, please, to the book of Judges, chapter 25. As we said yesterday in the Hebrew canon, the first words of the book of the Torah are the Hebrew name of the book. Numbers is Be'midbar, Be'midbar, in the wilderness. Let's read Numbers 25 and see what was reckoned to him as righteousness. And more importantly, what does it mean for us, this zeal of Phineas? Verse 1 of Numbers 25. While well, Israel remained in Shittim. Oh, by the way, well, that story happened in Judges 20. is just what John was talking about. Gibeah and, and Shiloh. That's where it happened. It's just where John was. But now we're in Numbers 25, verse 1. While well, Israel remained in Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. Now understand harlotry. Again, most of you know this from our teachings. When Israel committed idolatry, the idolatry was called adultery because Yahweh was Israel's Baal. We are imagio dei beings, made in God's image and likeness. 
You don't want somebody fooling around with your wife sexually because God doesn't want anybody fooling around with his. You don't want somebody fooling around with your husband or your wife. That's something that God put in us to teach about himself. He's a jealous God. He does not want anybody else fooling around with his spouse. Israel was to be his spouse as the church is the bride of Christ. He doesn't like anybody messing with his old lady. That's simply what it comes to. The idolatry is called adultery. Idolatry is called adultery. James picks this up in the New Testament. The oldest book of the New Testament canon written to Jewish believers. James Yaakov writes of worldly churches, you adulteresses. You adulteresses. Hillsong is an adulteress. It's the world. At their women's conference, go on YouTube. They had the naked cowboy. Two, three thousand Christian women cheering for the naked. The guy's standing there with a guitar, a cowboy hat, and a pair of boots. Then they had Jesus come out in female drag as the Statue of Liberty. Instead of a crown of thorns, he's got the Statue of Liberty's crown, and he's coming out, and they begin singing New York, New York. That's the worship of Hillsong at their women's conference in New York. With that guy Carl Lynn. And the whole thing was choreographed with pyrotechnics. It was pre-orchestrated and planned. It had to be. They had pyrotechnics, and it was choreographed. It was rehearsed. Their youth minister comes out the naked, just like the naked cowboy. Guys stand there on the stage with the cowboy boots and, the, and his women are clapping. It. They, they think that's worship. Yeah, it's Baal worship. But they're worshiping the wrong Baal. I'm only stating facts. Don't take my word for it. Google it. Watch it on YouTube. I'm not exaggerating or embellishing anything. It's right there for everyone to see. And the world sees it. The secular press reported it, both here and in Australia. The people began to play the harlot. Idolatry, adultery. For they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods. Would you like to attend Mass? Would you like to have an Islamic worship service? Let's have President Bush celebrate Ramadan in the White House and put a book that says God has no son in the White House to honor Islam after September 11th. They play the harlot. It is whoredom in what was a Judeo-Christian nation. In the eyes of Christ, it is whoredom. And the people bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor, or Baal at Peor, depends on how you translate it. And the Lord was angry against Israel, and the Lord said to Moses, to Moshe Rabbeinu, Take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. Take the leaders out and execute them with the sword. No, we don't chop their heads off with a literal sword, but we use this sword. These people leading us into this? Brian Houston, Carl Lynn, Bill Johnson, Paula White, the New Apostolic Reformation, take them out and slay them with the sword, saith the Lord. Not Jacob Prash, don't pay attention to him. Thus saith the Lord, take the leaders out and slay them. so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away. God is angry at this. When at that mental asylum with the cross on the roof in Redding, California, Bill Johnson, they're teaching that the Holy Spirit is a blue genie, that gets God angry. His spirit is not a blue genie. 
Jesus does not come out in female drag with the Statue of Liberty's crown instead of a crown of thorns and you sing New York, New York to him. I was born, I was born in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty. I used to go to right and back of it with my bicycle when I was a little boy. That's not Statue of Jesus. Take the leaders out. Execute them in broad daylight before the Lord. How can you talk that way about your brothers? Because God said to. I didn't write it. Just by his grace, I believe it. God said to. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you shall slay the men who've joined themselves to Baal of Peor, who've gone down the ecumenical road in bed with Rome and Chrislam and are playing footsies with Mormonism and God knows what else. Rick Warren's global peace plan. We have to unite with Hindus, Buddhists, Zoroastrians to bring in global peace. Demon worshipers. Take them out and slay them in broad daylight, saith the Lord God of Israel. But they're my brother. I don't want to do it. Would you rather have a plague? Those are your choices. an orthopedic surgeon, someone with gangrene in the per peripheral members, in the extremities. No surgeon wants to amputate a limb, but it's better to take a scalpel to their limb than take a scalpel to the corpse at the autopsy. Stop the plague. It'll destroy the body. There's no choice, a metastatic cancer, gangrene, tissue necrosis, you got to stop it. The body is rotting to death. This is a post-Christian, neo-pagan Western world. Britain is worse. You just sang, abide with me. Every Sunday, tens of thousands, probably a few hundred thousand people in England sing that hymn at a soccer match. They don't go to church, but they sing it at a soccer match as a theme song. That, and, I, and I, you'll never walk alone. They turn soccer into a religion. They don't go to church. There's nothing to do with Jesus, God, salvation, the scriptures, moral living. It's not about that. The hymn is the theme song for the soccer team, Manchester United or Liverpool, or whatever. That's what they sing. There's nobody in the churches singing that hymn because almost nobody goes to church anymore. That is the Western world. America is running on the inertia of its Christian past. It is going the way of England. The body is dying. There's a plague. You're blessed to be here. You know how many Christians in so-called Christian America are meeting in homes in small groups because they can't find the church? That is biblical? Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting. This was before the temple was built. The oh, hey, this is where the holy ark was, the presence of the Lord when it came down the Shekinah. He brings this Midianite woman. And they're weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting, trying to repent. And this guy is fornicating with this Midianite woman. Now understand what's happening here. The fornication between the Israelites and the Midianite woman is emblematic of the fornication of the nation with the pagan gods. You understand? The literal fornication of this guy with this woman is emblematic of the national fornication. That's what the text is saying. When Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of the priest, saw it, he arose from the midst of the congregation, took his spear in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both of them through. 
the man of Israel and the woman through the body. They were fornicating in the tent. They were fornicating where God's presence was. That was their mobile temple before they got to the land. They were fornicating before the Lord. You see these interfaith, multi-faith worships, these ecumenical services, they're fornicating in the house of God. They are fornicating in his presence. He went after them. He pierced both of them. So the plague on the sons of Israel was checked. Those who died by the plague were 24,000. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, this was Moses' grandnephew, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel and that he was jealous with my jealousy among them so that I did not destroy the sons of Israel in my sanctuary. Unless people stand up like Phineas. And do what Phineas did, not literally, but with this weapon. Unless people will do that, the plague will continue. America is doomed to become post-Christian and neo-pagan, the same as Europe. Britain is almost as bad as continental Europe, and America is getting as bad as Britain. The show is over. You want to see churches growing? Come with me to Vietnam where they're persecuted. I'll show you growth. They're impoverished, they're persecuted, they have nothing, they have very little qualified leadership, but their churches are growing. Some of the most impoverished areas of Africa, Steve was just in Malawi. The churches are growing. They don't have anything, but they have Jesus. I was in China a month ago meeting with pastors in the underground church. They're being locked up, but the churches are growing. I've said this many times. I have seen and met true Christians in Ohio. I have seen and met true Christians in Australia, in Canada, in Great Britain. I've met true Christians in many countries. Thank God for every one of them. I've met true Christians in Columbus. But the only places I've seen true Christianity, like the book of Acts, is where God's people are being persecuted. And persecution is terrible. I'm not glorifying it. But it cleans out the dead wood It becomes a necessary evil. You want to see real Christianity? I have to go back to Hanoi next month. Come with me. I'll show you real Christianity. They took this one pastor who came to my meetings and locked him up for 18 days. They knocked all his teeth out. Then they let him out so everybody could see what they did to him. And then they locked him up again. And he still doesn't stop preaching. The churches are growing. Let's look. Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel, and that he was jealous with my jealousy among them. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God, but it was God's own jealousy that burned in his heart. God is jealous for Israel, and he's jealous for the church. He doesn't want anybody, anybody, fooling around with his woman. That intimacy is his. He bought us with his blood. He's entitled to it. Nobody else is entitled to get in bed with the body of Christ, and the body of Christ should not get in bed with some or some harlot religion, including harlot Christendom. I did not destroy the sons of Israel because of him and my jealousy. 
Therefore say, Behold, I give him my covenant of peace. It shall be for him and his descendants after him a covenant of perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. If you don't know, peace in Greek is Irene. We get the girl's name Irene. It means an absence of conflict. But Hebrew, it's shalom. Shalom comes from the infinitive of the Hebrew verb leshalem, to pay, to fill, to fulfill. We have shalom because Jesus, Yeshua, came to leshalem, to pay the price for our sins, to fulfill the law, and to fill us with his spirit. You can be in the biggest conflict of your life and have shalom. Shlomi ani yaten lehem, my peace I give to you, not like the world. Now, ultimately, in the millennial reign of Christ, his shalom will include the absence of conflict. When Jesus reigns from the throne of David, the nations will indeed bend their spears into pruning hooks. It will ultimately include the absence of conflict, but that's not what it is. You can be in the worst conflict you can ever imagine and have shalom. I've seen it in the persecuted church. You want to read something Read Tortured for Christ by a Jewish believer, Richard Wormbrand. I knew him. You should read that book. Fourteen years in a communist prison being tortured. He had no arena, but he had shalom. Now he's with Jesus. His reward. And after him a covenant, a perpetual priesthood. Verse 14, now the name of the slain man of Israel who was slain with the Midianite woman was Tzimri, the son of Shalu, meaning the one who was sent, a leader of his father's household among the Simeonites. Notice it was a leader. You see leaders on the platform with the Pope. You know the Pope. Pope Francis, when he was Cardinal and Archbishop in Buenos Aires, Argentina, he refused to meet with the families of children molested by priests and nuns. You know Pope Francis. He's the one who said, if two men are in a same-sex relationship, who am I to judge? Hey, Pope, try reading Romans chapter 1. God Almighty has already judged. It was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, pontiff. No, I'm not kissing your ring. That's emperor worship. I worship the God of Israel. Let us continue. He was a leader. The name of the Midianite woman who was slain was Cosby. That derives from the term lie. Lie. In Aramaic, it's like the word for lie, basically. Kozva, Kozvi. He got in bed with a lie. Other religions are a lie. We can all be one. We have the same God. That's a lie. Allah is not Elohim. It's a lie. The Mormon Jesus is not our Jesus. It's a lie. The ecumenical Jesus is not the Jesus of Scripture. It's a lie. You're in bed with a lie. You're fornicating in God's house. Kozvi, the daughter of Tzur, who was head of the people of the father's household in Midian. All you need is the leaders to have parlance. Once the leaders do it, so goes the shepherds, so goes the sheep. Oh, it must be all right. Pastor so-and-so is doing it. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, be hostile to the Midianites and strike them, for they have been hostile to you with their tricks with which they have deceived you in the affair of Peor and in the affair of Kozvi, the daughter of the leader of Midian, their sister who was slain on the day of the plague because of Peor. They were hostile to you with their tricks. 
If someone burglarizes your house, they've robbed you. If someone knocks on the door as posing as a salesman and sells you double glazing, and they go upstairs and install plaster glass, they've also robbed you. You were defrauded. Either way, you've been ripped off. Be hostile to them. They're hostile to you with their tricks. Oh, they seem so nice. Find me a con artist who doesn't. By definition, they seem nice. But they have an agenda. And that agenda is spiritual seduction. If somebody holds a 45 to your head and rips you off, they've robbed you. If they pick your pocket while smiling, they've also robbed you. What's the difference? Oh, but they were nice. I met the imam and he was nice. The grand mufti of Damascus spoke in Robert Shuler's church. He was so nice. Robert Shuler said he wouldn't mind if his grandchildren became Muslims. He said that. Oh, the Holy Father seems so nice. One is your Father who's in heaven. Call no man your Father, saith the Lord. They seem so nice. Be hostile to them, for they were hostile to you with their tricks. A con artist is as much a thief as a highway robber. What's the difference? There is no difference. Fornicating in God's house before the Lord? That is what they are doing. Can you imagine waking up in your bed and watching your husband and your wife in that bed with somebody else right in front of you? What would you think? Well, how would you react? Would you be slightly disturbed? God is enraged. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Oh, you're not loving or gracious. If he didn't love his wife, he wouldn't care what she did. If you love the Lord and if you love his body, his true body, the body of Christ, you will do whatever it takes to stop the plague. To refuse to stop the plague in the name of being nice or gracious or Christian or loving, that is not the love of the Lord. It is at best, at best, ignorance. More likely, religious cowardice. Remember, first Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. That your love, that your agape may abound more and more in all knowledge and real discernment. Underline that verse, highlight it. It is a verse for the time in which we live. It's that one. The love of the Lord depends on knowledge of his word and discernment. Without it, you're not going to have love. You're going to have a stupid, cheap, emotionally charged religious counterfeits. Oh, but she's so nice. She's an old lady. Yeah, and she's broadcasting heretics. This is the sermon ministry of some sort, prophetic ministry, in, 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 on the radio in Minneapolis that does that. They're featuring people on their website who, who's, who say that the church is not under the new covenant. They just, oh, but they're okay because they're pre-tribulational. Yeah, but they're heretics. No, they're pre-tribulational. They're all right. But she's got another one who's an annihilationist. There's no such place as eternal hell. Oh, but he's pre-trib, so he's all right. You can't speak about that woman that way. I'm only telling you what's on her website. You're unloving. No, I'm telling you the truth. Who is going to stop the plague? 
open fornication by the leaders and the presence of God drawing the nation, drawing the people, drawing the church into its. Take the leaders out and slay at them in broad daylight, saith the Lord. Stop the plague. Get that patient to a surgical theater and amputate before they die of necrosis, before the gangrene kills them, before the cancer metastasizes to the liver and we can't save their life. Get them to the operating table and saw the thing off. I'm sorry, but we've got to save the life. No surgeon wants to do that. But he'd rather do that than go to the post-mortem. No preacher wants to do this. But if it isn't done, there's going to be an autopsy on the body of Christ in America, the same as is happening in Britain and Europe. Post-Christian, neo-pagan, the show is over. What do you want? Somebody alive missing a limb, or do you want a corpse? Those are the only two choices. You can either amputate, or you can have a corpse. I'll take the lesser of two evils. God can grow another one. He can do miracles. Just like in Benjamin. All the men were purged. They were all dead. But God replenished them, didn't he? He said, here's what you do. Yeah, the plague came, killed 24,000, but the Lord can restore them. Get rid of the dead wood. Remember, growth in a church and a real revival, it begins with pruning. Prayer and pruning. Revivals begin with subtractions, not additions. Once you get rid of the dead wood and make way for the new growth, then God adds to the numbers. Revivals do not begin with additions. They begin with subtractions. Prayer and subtractions. That's reality. That's the way it is. Do I like it? No. Do I want to say these things? Believe me, I don't. I would rather be preaching the gospel with passion to the unsaved than saying these things. Phineas, Pincus, Lord, shall I go up against my brother? It's my brother. I don't want to do it. It's my brother. Do it. Take the leaders out and slay them in broad daylight. Do it and do it quick. There's a plague, dear friends. Why do you think this Fellowship exists. Now may the Lord add to your numbers through people being saved and born again and discipled here. Amen. Don't become introspective and be based on what you came out of. The philosophy has to be they're getting it wrong, we have to get it right. Preach the gospel, make disciples by all means. But why does this fellowship exist? Because of an amputation. You came from a dying body, a corpse that is rotting from a self-inflicted toxin. That's why this fellowship exists and others like it. Because there's a plague. There's a plague, my friends. A lethal plague. A depopulating plague. An ugly, demonic plague. There is a plague. There's only one question. There's only one question for you and for this fellowship. Where is Phineas? Where is Pincus? Who is going to stop the plague? Thank you for listening. My name is Jacob Prash. This is Fellowship Bible Chapel in Columbus, Ohio. God bless you.